Hello and welcome to CCNA Security um, <clears throat> Chapter 1. So before we get started, I just want to let you know what you need to do. Take out and maybe open up a new Microsoft Word, and I'm going to ask you to take specific notes as we go along with the lecture, and you jot those down, and you'll submit those as homework. Okay, now you can take as many notes as you want from the lecture, but I want specific things that I will point out to you that I want you to submit, just evidence that you have um, viewed the whole chapter. I highly recommend that you read the chapter as well. These are just slides, and I am gonna highlight and summarize it, um, what are the important points. Um, the lecture will be um, a little bit long. It might take us close to an hour. So what i like you to do is maybe do it in maybe 10 or even 15 minute chunks. After 10 or 15 minutes, just take a break and then um, go get something to drink or uh, and then you'll continue later on. You don't have to sit down for an hour or so and listen to the whole thing because I don't want you to get bored and then uh, not pay any attention. It's important that you, um, that you just take everything within, I think within 15 minute chunk, it makes it a lot easier. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about chapter one and the network security threats that are out there. Um, there are four sections that we will talk about. We'll talk about securing the network specifically, the network threats and how to mitigate these threats, make it a little bit easier to take care of. Okay, so when it comes to networks that are out there that are connected to the internet, everyone is a target. And you know, you know, no one has specifically have to be targeting you. So because you are connected to the network, there are many viruses, software out there that can scan to see if there's any openings and they'll go in and they'll sit dormant, for example, for a while, and they'll attack your network, send data to the attacker remotely. Um, or even viruses. So they don't even have to be specifically targeting you. The, you know, software are out there looking for any vulnerabilities, any threat, you know, any vulnerabilities that any open ports that they can go through. So you want to have, because you are connected to the rest of the world, you want to have these firewalls, those IPSs sitting at the border of your network to protect you from these attacks. The common network security terms that we are going to be concerned with are a threat. A threat is somebody that has maybe a software um, or someone that wants to attack your network. So that threat looks for vulnerability. Vulnerabilities is when you have some weaknesses that somebody can exploit. So for example, um, a good example of vulnerability is if you, high, if you have your car window open with the keys in it or the car window is broken, that's a vulnerability that somebody can get in your car and take it. The threat is somebody can maybe take your car. Mitigation, how do you mitigate against this threat is close your window, take the key away, put the alarm on, all right? Uh, the risk is, the risk could be, you know, you lose your car or uh, how do you mitigate against this risk? Maybe you buy insurance that if it's stolen, somebody will pay you back, it's things like that. Or if your car is old and you don't care about it, you can accept the risk. You know, if it got lost or somebody stole your car, you don't care about it. All right. So we'll talk about, so I just want to make sure you understand these terms when we, uh, when we're saying them as we go along. Okay, the vectors of the network attacks, where do they come from? If either they come in from inside the network or from outside. The inside of the network are the most difficult one, the internal threats, because your employees have specific rights and privileges that they have access to, so they may be exploited. Or if they come in from outside and they bring in um, a device that's not protected, that might introduce viruses into your network. External threats is somebody attacking you from the outside, but they have to go through the firewall, you know? But the thing is, if they go from outside, they may need to exploit another a host, you know, get their name, get their IP address, pretend to be them so they can go through the firewall and attack your network. We'll talk about how do we protect 
you know, uh, external threats by setting up a firewall to look for those external effects. And we'll also talk about the internal threat, the LAN. How can you protect specific attacks within the local area network? Data loss, vectors of data loss. You can, somebody can attack your emails or webmail. Somebody can attack encrypted devices, the cloud storage devices, removable media like USB drives, hard copies. You know, that's why you got to shred your papers. You know, the, a lot of the stuff that I know is hard copies. They have information in there that can, that can be used to access the network. We'll talk about that also in the coming in the coming days. And improper access control, not knowing how, where, or where to access your computers. For example, everyone should have a specific device that they can access or um, or not, you know, you don't care about what the passwords are or how big the passwords are. So if you if you are not careful, uh, you could lose your data in any of these. Okay, so here's the first thing that I want you to submit. The different types of data losses, vectors of data loss, I want you to write those six points down. Okay, all right, let's move on to the topology overview. Here is a typical local area network, and there's your internet. The first device that's going to be facing the internet is your virtual private network. This is where you all the data that leaves this device, the VPN, is going to be encrypted. So nothing leaves your LAN without being encrypted. As we've discussed uh, last time we met, a virtual private network is where they create a tunnel and then put the and then take your data, encrypt it, and stick it into that tunnel and then you are going over the internet. A virtual private network is to connect one, uh, one site with another site going through the internet. So you wanna make sure that the data when it travels through the internet, it is encrypted through a tunnel so no one else will be able to see the data. How do they actually do that? What they do is they take your packet, they encrypt it, and then they re-encapsulate it with another packet, that's the tunneling. So you the data that's inside is encrypted and the tunneling is the packet that's being encapsulated before it leaves. So all data that comes into here has to be decrypted before it's sent to a firewall. The ASA is the, uh, the, um, the Cisco appliance for a firewall. And what is a firewall? A firewall is nothing but like a security guard that has a list of who is permitted or denied to enter the network or even leave the network. Then you, you go through an IPS, an intrusion prevention system. Intrusion preventions look to see if there's an attack. There are attacks like denial of service attacks, specific attacks that's, that may attack web servers, they may attack uh, emails. They have a specific patterns, known patterns that an IPS will be able to detect. And if it detects a specific signature, or an anomaly to a specific type of traffic, it will prevent it from going through into your network. Okay, uh, we have a AAA server, which we'll also, by the way, we're gonna be discussing a VPN at one chapter. We're gonna be discussing a firewall in another chapter, how to set up a, an IPS in another chapter and a AAA server that's coming up soon in the next couple of weeks. A AAA server, authentication authorization and accounting server is where you get authenticated. When somebody calls in and wants to have access to the network, they go to the AAA server, they'll check your name, they check your password, you get authenticated, then you are authorized, you know, you are, then you are given um, rights and privileges to access specific resources. And there's the accounting part is where you actually, um, they give you a list of what you have accessed, just like your credit card. We'll talk about that later on. The three layer switches allow you to connect between VLANs. The ESAW, WSA is also for, uh, to check for, um, that's like a non-intrusion prevention system, but um, that's not, um, I'm not, I think it is, if I'm not mistaken, it's a type of uh, an IPS, but uh, 
it does not sit in line with the network. Okay, so let's move on. If you have a small office, a Soho, a small office, home office network, you have the wireless LAN that you have to be protect. You have to uh, set up security on, like the WPA you guys are probably familiar with. And these devices, when they send their data, they have to be encrypted. So we'll talk about how to secure a wireless LAN into a wired network, a layers two switch. We also have to secure the ports on the switch to make sure that only specific devices um, that can connect into your network using MAC address filtering, for example. So we'll talk all about the internal Soho network, even in your at home. Wide area network, if you remember, a wide area network is the interconnection of two LANs that are in different geographic area. Now, if these two lands have to pass sensitive data and they have to go through the internet, like we discussed earlier, they have to, you have to set up a VPN between them. You can go privately and use a private, you know, uh, and you can set up a frame relay or a PPP, you know, using a dedicated line that can, that can connect to the other site. So either way, um, you still want to either have some sort of security, especially if your data is secured. Probably most, I would say 80% of the people opt for a VPN because it's less expensive and you control everything. Data center network. So if you have a data center that ha on the premises, you want to make sure that the security offices that are out there, fences, gates, if you have a, you know, you have, um, your routers, your switches, your big data centers, depending on how big the company is, you want to make sure all of that is secure. Survey, you know, video surveillance, um, even monitors in terms of temperatures and humidity to make sure that the facility as well has the HVAC in there. And uh, if there is any problems or any security police breaches, there's alarms that can actually uh, alert either the police department or um, the officers or the security guards that there's a problem within within the network itself. Inside the perimeter perimeter of the um, of the building, you want to have electronic motion detectors. You know, on weekends, for example, you activate them to see if there's anything moving around, security traps, continuous video surveillance, biometric access and exit sensors you know the biometric access is you got to put your thumb in to have access even your you know your eye retina might be used um, to allow you access into your network cloud and virtual networks let's just make sure we clarify clouds meaning that you are storing your data off site somewhere else there's another party somewhere they have their servers and that's where you put all your data um, so that could, of course, have its own problems in terms of security. The, the third party may not be, may not have a secured network. Their servers may not be secured. So you got to make sure that they have, um, they have been accredited by the ISO 27001 um, standards, which specifies that they have to be well secured in terms of firewalls, the structure, the topology, and so on. Uh, virtual networks is VMware is when you have, for example, you know, like we're using the uh, VMware on your machines when you are setting up uh, the virtual box, for example, you can set up a whole bunch of different operating systems and you have the base um, on your on your on your computer itself, the base operating system, and you'll let a lot of virtual machines on your networks. A lot of people do that because it's much easier. Now, all the other applications are like, uh, uh, could be their own operating system. So first of all, you don't, you save a tremendous amount of money and you don't have to spend buying the actual devices. And if anything goes wrong with, or if there's an attack on, on specific server, it's nothing but really an application that you can shut down and reload. It does not affect the whole network. But specific threats to cloud computing and virtual networks it could be hyperjacking somebody hyper you know attacking your actual uh the hyper v network the, the actual 
uh, network that hosts all these virtual machines, instant on activation, antivirus storms may happen. Uh, components of securing the data center, you know, securing the segmentation, how do you break up the data center so that if one is attacked, part of that, not everything is, you know, sometimes they split the data and they put them in two different servers just to make sure that uh, if even one part is stalling, they cannot get the whole data out. In fact, that's what they do with the PKI when they create the public key and the um, and the private key, the private key that is saved is actually split into and placed into two different locations. So if somebody actually were able to attack one of the server, then they really don't get the actual key because the other part of the key is somewhere else. Uh, threat defense and visibility you have to re really worry about. And we'll discuss any all of that, the cloud and the virtual network threats and uh, how to mitigate these threats again later on and they as we go along in these um, in this course uh, when it comes to the network border you when you have mobile devices more and more people are they have this bring your own device to the network so more and more organizations are asking their employees to bring in their own devices either their laptops or even their phones or their mobile devices and they they place an actual application on there so that they can have access to their network. But with your BYOD, the bring in your own network devices, bring in your own devices, that creates a lot of problems and a lot of headaches to a lot of to um, companies. So there is a mobile device management software that you can, that's the MDM, placing on your mobile devices that can control, that can do data encryption, pin enforcement, wipe out the data. If your mobile device got lost, you know, they wipe it out remotely, data loss prevention, jailbreak, root detection, all of that MDM is doing, uh, will take care of that for you. So here's the number two, the evolving, the MDM functions for the BOD. I want you to write those five points down. That's what the MDM does for the bring your own device networks. Okay, let's continue. All right, so let's take a look at who is hacking our network. Okay, so let's look at some titles. Script kiddies. Script kiddies are anyone that has no experience whatsoever and just wants to either purchase an exploit kit, run it, or even find any program on the internet and run it and just try to either break into a wireless network or just for fun, break into someone and steal somebody's data or scare somebody. Vulnerability brokers, the ones that look in to look for loopholes that they can have access. They know all the different loopholes in software and operating systems and try to create a program that can break into these networks. Hack of it's, you know, somebody that, you know, they uh, like the ones that are anonymous, the ones that they, all they do is they break into your network just for uh, political reasons. They really don't want any money or, or, or they're not looking to uh, create havoc. They just maybe for embarrassment for uh, to a government or someone or something like that. Cyber criminals are the ones that are there to do are there for either profit, you know, the ones that send a virus to your device that will encrypt your hard drive and then they ask you for a key, I ask you to pay money so that they give you a key to decrypt your um, decrypt your um, hard drive. And state-sponsored hackers, you know, it's well known probably every country have their own type of hackers to attack the service of other countries that are out there. There is the white hackers, the gray hackers, and the black hackers. The white hackers are the ones that break into a network to solve problems. They're not there to, you know, they saw, they are the good guys. The black hackers are the ones that break into your network, try to steal data. The gray hackers are the ones that you know, they know how to break into a network, but they don't do anything, but they sell that information to someone else, that they, to the black guys, to the black hat hackers that they break into. You know, the, one, the black hat hackers are the ones that use the data or use the software to break into your network for maybe uh, 
for profit or or just to um, either steal your data or corrupt your hard drive or whatever. Okay, what type of tools does a hacker use? In the old days, you have to have a really technical knowledge that are needed to break into the network. Nowadays, in 2015 and even past that, you don't have to know anything, just like I told you earlier. You can easily run a, get a lot of programs off the internet and either purchase them or a, a lot of them are free and they can use them to break into almost any network. You know, you can easily find programs out there that can break into WPA um, secured network. Okay, here are different tools that are out there that you can use. Password crackers, wireless hacking, all of these, the snip packets, never rootkit detectors. All of these are being used as tools to, for penetrating testing. Okay, see the penetrating meaning you want to test. You, you, you may buy, purchase a software that will test to see if your passwords are strong enough. So you tell your employees, for example, your password have to be minimum of 10, 10 character long, and it has to have capital letters, lowercase letters, and some numbers in there. And you can run the password crackers to make sure that all the passwords adhere to the standard and you'll and after you do that you can try to penetrate you're trying to crack somebody's password to see if there's any vulnerabilities so you can use any of these tools to really penetrate and test to see if your network adheres to the standards that you set up and if you still see a problem and you were able to penetrate then you have to you know do some adjustment maybe okay Different types of attacks that are out there, eavesdropping, somebody watching your data, uh, data modification, as if they see the data, they can um, change it, either change it to whatever they want, IP addressing, spoofing, somebody stealing your IP address, pretending to be you, password based, somebody getting you your password, denial of service attacks, you know, not able to have access to your server or your resources because somebody is either sending a tremendous amount of requests and bringing the server down, or it could be if a wireless, if it's a wireless uh, access point, uh, you jam the signal. Man in the middle, somebody that captures the data when it's going from the sender to the receiver, looking at it, taking whatever they want from it, and then relaying it to the receiver, the sender and the receiver will never know that that man in the middle actually captured that data. A compromised key, somebody knows what the actual key that is being used or figuring out what the key is that it's being encrypted so they can always decrypt the data. All right, so, and a sniffer. A sniffer is a protocol analyzer. It's a software that watches the data flowing in the network. So to really protect all of the, all of these different types of attacks, if you encrypt your data, then you can, it's almost impossible to do any of this. So that's why encryption is important. Okay, let's take a look at the different types of malware. Different types of malware, there is the virus, the worm, and the Trojan horse. The virus itself, a virus is nothing but a program that attaches itself to a legitimate program. A virus is the one that you have to download. If you go to a specific site and you die, you know, you may think that you're downloading a legitimate file, but that legitimate file has been changed or another file attaches to it, comes down to your PC and wants it down and you run it, it will either erase your hard drive or run different types of program on your hard drive, unwanted programs. And of course it can, viruses can, depending on the type of virus, it is very, very difficult to get rid of. So uh, most likely you're gonna end up cleaning your hard drive, reformatting it, and even sometimes repartition your hard drive to get rid of that virus. That's probably the only way to do it. That's why it is extremely important to, um, to make sure that you have everything backed up. And what is a worm? A worm is nothing but a virus, but that virus will propagate from one device to another if you are on a network. 
without the intervention of the user. So that's the difference between a worm and a virus. A Trojan horse is a type of a virus, a malware, malicious software, that's what it really malware stands for, is when you download it, it sits dormant and it just doesn't do anything to, to a specific time when it, when it kicks in or a specific event when you, when you let's say, execute a specific program, that's when they start to kick in. And what they do, they can do the, they can do a security software disabler. They can disable some of the securities that are out there, take, out, take away your rights from accessing specific resources, re allowing remote access, even though you may not allow that, uh, send data out to the hacker, whoever, wherever that hacker is. They can destroy your PC or your device that it is attacks, you know, set up being a proxy to work for someone else, use your name to attack others, a file transfer protocol, we can transfer file from your device to the hacker, or just a denial of service attack, which means, you know, you won't be able to access your device. Any of this can happen um, from a Trojan horse. Again, like I said, a worm is really a virus that when it's downloaded on a computer that is connected to a network, that virus will propagate by itself without the intervention of the user. The code read, as you can see, within 19 hours, it almost took almost how all the word that had um, it propagated so fast that almost all the SQL servers in the world were infected. The component of a worm is the, specifically the code red is the propagate for 19 days and then launch the denial of service attack. You won't be able to access your server and then just sit around and do nothing and then to repeat the process. So it was very difficult to get work. The SQL server, when they were attacked, uh, Microsoft two weeks prior to the attack actually had a patch and uh, they were able to uh, send out that patch. The administrators that downloaded and installed that patch didn't have any problems. The one that did not, of course, got the attack. So what that tells you is it's very important that you always download and install all um, security patches or any type of security patches from any software or operating system that you have. Don't even think about not doing that. Okay, moving on. Other malwares that are out there. Ransomware. Ransomware is when somebody sends in a virus and will ask you to um, decrypt your, or will encrypt your hardware, a uh, hard drive. And then a message comes on the screen and says to you, okay, you better send me $300 in Bitcoins so I can send you the key. Believe it or not, some people will send the money and a lot of times the key doesn't even work. Don't pay them. Mo the worst case scenario, if you feel that your computer, by the way, is acting funny and while you're online and it's not responding, immediately shut it off. That will prevent the software from being installed. That's probably the only way you can prevent ransomware. Uh, that's all really scareware. You know, somebody may, uh, that's also for profit. Um, they can actually use your camera, take a picture of you and say, we're going to, this is the, you know, we uh, take a picture of you and to a specific sub and uh, to a specific website and they can blackmail you telling you that you were doing this and that and you better pay up or otherwise we'll send you to we'll send your information to the FBI that you were doing some illegal stuff on the internet spyware is a software that goes on your computer that will watch every little detail that you are typing and um, and usually for advertisement purposes for example one time I had a spyware on one of my computers and if I type, for example, the vry.edu and I wanted to go to the website, they knew they, that I typed the vry.edu and it was in university, a lot of advertisements for universities came up. 
that software were just watching everything that I want. And that's part of the adware. Adwares is unwanted ads that keeps popping up. But that's, you know, the the adwares, the spywares, a lot of, and even the phishing, well, not the phishing. The adwares are where um, a lot of the um, browsers take care of all of that. Phishing is when somebody sends you an email or a, me or a message telling you that uh, soliciting information from you that you may not know what's going on. For example, I one time I got an email that, from eBay saying that I purchased a $2,000 TV and I better click on this link to verify that you did or did not. Don't ever do that. And because they, they'll ha they had the logo of eBay, everything. But if you do click on that link, they're going to take you somewhere else and get take your information and use your account, of course, to do whatever they want to do with it. So phishing, the only way to protect against phishing is to know this is type of source, you know, social engineering, you call it, when they solicit information from you, is to know that there are bad people out there and never ever to verify any type of accounts when you're online. Rootkits. Rootkits are software that goes on your computer, gather information from whatever you're doing, send it to the hacker somewhere else, and when it's done, it erases its footprints. So you'll, you don't even know that they do exist. Uh, Rootkits actually started out with Sony when they were doing the CDs. They wanted to make sure that uh, everybody that bought you know those music cds did not copy them on their computer so what they did is they created root kits to find out who's doing what that's of course was illegal and that's where these programs came out from believe it or not all right different types of network attacks there is the sync flood attacks data modification and smurf attack that can lead to reconnaissance access and denial of service attack let me just go back a little bit sync attack is really has been every time you want to do a tcp ip connection if you remember tcp is connection oriented they you know they do the sync they do hello they want to make sure you're connected before they send you any data so if you keep sending a, a synchronous signal to the receiver to make sure he's there and the guy keeps responding back to you say yes i'm here for acknowledgement you're supposed to send back you know it's a three-way handshake and acknowledge his acknowledgement but if you ignore that and you just keep sending the you know a synchronous signal and he keeps responding back and you're ignoring that respond this is like somebody you know calling you and you pick up the phone, you keep saying hello, the guy doesn't respond, he keeps calling you, keep picking up the phone. So what he's doing, he's doing a denial of service. No one else can call you because he keeps calling you and keeping the phone busy. Data modification is being able to take the data and change it to something else. Smurf attack is going to the network using someone else's IP address to attack another guy. So if I am the attacker, I'm really free and if they ever find out who attacks is someone else all of these by the way have been um taken care of okay reconnaissance attack reconnaissance is to before an attacker um actually does anything they scan and find out what's going on you know if somebody wants to steal a car they go into the parking lot and they look for the most vulnerable car um so in, in data communication, they send out, for example, they ask questions, query of the target. You know, what do you have? What do you do? They may ask us, who is the command that you can use? They can use ping sweep. They send a ping sweep. They send out a ping to all the devices in the network and find out who's going to respond. Anybody respond, they know they're connected so they can pinpoint and find, you know, so if you don't respond, that means you're not connected. I don't even have to worry about it. That's why... Microsoft created the, the in the firewall, if you try to ping another device uh, when running Windows 7 or higher, they don't even respond back to you. Port scan, you can check out, you know, which application is open to receive data. You know, port numbers, you look for port numbers to see what the port numbers are that are out there, that are open. Vulnerability scanners to see which one has loopholes, which uh, operating system has loopholes that I can use, you know, by default and exploitation tools that you can use also 
that you know you can buy off the internet to actually break into specific networks all right so here's another note that i want you to send in the reconnaissance attack write these five points i want you to submit that and uh the access attacks access attacks is a few reasons why hackers use access attack is to retrieve data gain access, of course escalate access privileges change the um, the privileges and when you have when get into the network the first thing that you want to do gives your make sure that no one gets rid of you so you got to change the um your privileges your rights and maybe even get rid of the maybe the um the supervisor's rights to make sure that they will be able to get rid of you um, here's the different types of access attacks they can steal your passwords trust or exp exploitation you know uh, somebody may think that you're okay and give you the information, all the information that you needed to have access. Poor port redirection. If you're going to an HTTP server, I'll change the port number from 80 to something else. So you could be directed to a different server. Man in the middle. Like I said, somebody has a software that's watching all the data that's going through the network. Buffer overflow, attacking your uh, your memory on your computer and it will just you won't be able to do anything anymore ip mac dhcp spoofing you know uh pretend stealing the mac address the ip or getting into the dhcp server all right so here's another notes a few types of access attacks i want you to write these down these six points down social en engineering attacks even before we discuss it i want you to read I want you to type all of these down. What are the different types of social engineering attacks? Social engineering is being able to gather information from the victim. So if the victim is not aware that he is being, he's giving out information, sensitive information to the attacker, um, that's what social engineering, it could be by phishing, you know, sending you an email. It could be a spam email, you know, an email that uh, says, hey, um, you've been uh, or somebody even calling you telling uh, telling you that you, uh, you know, this is the irs please give us a call uh, you have some problems with your taxes so as soon as you call the first thing they're going to ask you give me your social security number your name your birthday they gather all that information they pretend that they're doing something and said okay your account is good you hang up of course you give up your information and then they can use it to do whatever they want right so you have to give up something you have to be aware that that in you know the irs will never call you for example uh your bank will never ask you to change the bin number on your atm card via the internet okay so all of that information you need to know never click on a link where you have to verify your account okay they want to be able to get you you may get an email saying for example um oh uh yeah you, you know please donate a dollar for this poor family that has five kids and uh, they're really having a hard time they may get you doing that on the holidays when you feel a little bit you know given so and they can make thousands and thousands of dollars all they do is send out a spam if one can respond you know, if they can get a hundred, they can send out millions of requests via email. If they can get a hundred thousand of them, you know, one percent, we're good to go. They make a hundred thousand dollars, and that's a kill for them. All right, so you have to be aware. How do you prevent? How do you mitigate against social engineering? It's really um, education. You have to let your employees know what they should should they should never, to, for example, respond to any of these emails. And just ignore them because even if they don't they may just want to get your email and sell your email okay moving on denial of service attacks a dos is means that uh, legitimate users cannot have that or do not have access to their resources either could be their printer because uh, the printer is be either shut down or is printing a lot, you know, an infinite amount of paper because somebody is doing that, or not a lot, or being not able to access a specific server because somebody's doing so much requests. If it was for wireless, you don't have access to your access point or router 
because there's someone run, jamming the signal by running by uh, by having another device that running at 2.4 or a 5 gigahertz that has higher power so you you will never be able to communicate with your wireless router all of these are different types of denial of service attacks okay distributed denial of service attacks what that does the way it works is a hacker what they do will send out a program to thousands of computers out there like a virus or even millions all of these computers there's millions of computers that have that virus are now called zombies because you as a hacker can control them by executing those programs on these computers so you have what's called a robot network actually it's called a botnet so they are all under your control so you have a botnet of million computers waiting for your um, for your command so once you execute that command and you tell these servers to send requests to the tell these computers to send these requests to a specific server these millions of computers when they start sending requests to a server that server will not be able to um, service all of these requests and legitimate users that want to access that server they are in trouble of course um, that's why you need an intrusion prevention system an IPS to be able to detect these type of distributed denial of service attacks DDoS's so there's a specific patterns that they can recognize and stop it you know amazon were attacked a few years ago and they were able to detect these ddos attacks uh i know um i think mastercard were not be able they were down a few years ago they were down for like three or four days so okay it, it, these are the most famous ones the ddos attacks that are still sometimes uh, very difficult to uh, pre to prevent okay so let's talk about um, defending the network then mitigate against yes, these are the different types of security network security professional jobs that you can have out there okay let's just move on the, the different organizations that we discussed about later on um, we have the SANS I think that the me I think the the certs the SANS you should take a look at the SANS are the one that keeps up to you know the ones that keep up to date of all the different viruses that are out there the ISC2 squared is the one where you get your certifications um, there is the NIST that we talk that I told you about the other day the National Institute a standard technology from the mistake let me see I just I think I have it in here in my other Oops, nope, not here. Here, yeah, the um, the National Institute of Standard Technology. Um, I were in December of uh, December 12, 2013. There was an executive order on improving the critical infrastructure of the cybersecurity. So the NIST is out there as right now to make sure that there we develop the framework to reduce the cyber risks to critical the infrastructure of the of the whole United States and it gathers all the best practices that incorporate into this framework um, let's go back to our actual lecture so there are plenty of organizationals you should definitely visit them and uh, see what they can offer you they keep you up to date with all the different types of security the you know um, what do you what about um, Cisco also have their ISO as well their organization that keeps up to date of the latest and the greatest attacks on uh, with the cyber attacks that are out there okay components of cryptography I want you to write those also three different components the confidentiality integrity and the availability confidentiality means not only write the con the three I want you to write uh, the definition of each confidentiality means um, you want to only only the sender and the receiver the authorized users are the ones that are able to see the data so how do we make how do we do that how do we protect the confidentiality of the data 
we use encryption. We encrypt the data. So only the sender and the receiver uh, have the keys to decrypt the data. Integrity means we want to make sure that the data that we are sending is the data that's being received. How do we do that? Is we hatch the data. We use a hashing program that that's going to take a picture of the data, for example, not really, and they come up with a number and that number is stamped specific number is a unique number depending on how the data look. We'll discuss how that works. You stamp it on that piece of data, that hash, and you send the data with the hash on it. So when the guy on the other end receives it, the first thing that they do is they take a picture of the same data. The number that comes up have to match the, the hash that's stamped on the data that's that was received. If it's the same, then the data has not been altered. That's how you can protect the integrity of the data. Availability is being able to have access to all the resources that you want. Okay, so we want to make sure that no viruses, no denial of service attacks, you have um, backups of devices. So making sure um, that users have the resources available to them 24 seven if it's needed. So your job is to make sure to protect the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability of your data. That's what cryptography is really for. Again, write those three uh, components of cryptography down with their definitions. I want you to submit that, of course. Okay, moving on. Uh, when it comes to domains, the network security domain. So we are going to look at risk assessment. Security risk assessment, for example, is you want to take a what you first do when you get into a, an organization is you want to take a look at how the whole take an inventory of all the assets and see how they are secured and then assess the risk. What's the what's the what's the likelihood that these assets uh, might be lost or stolen or damaged due to attacks? And then you mitigate. You try. Then you saw. You know. Then you plug in the loophole depending on which are the most important assets that you need to protect. That includes your employees too, not only devices and software that are in the network. An asset is anything. An asset is anything that a company pays for. To, to produce them and use that product or that employee or that device to make them money. So you need to protect all of these assets. Security policy is a written document that all the employees must adhere to. It may say, for example, um, you cannot download specific things. You can only access the network on Monday to Friday and you cannot bring in uh, USB drives, whatever they are. And they are changeable. You got to close your door. If you have a laptop, you have to secure it to the desk. So there's a whole bunch. You can only answer emails. You can't use your devices for personal use, whatever. But it has to be written down. And there are rules and regulations and that you set up and you discuss that with the upper management. So once you have a written security policy, you go over it and highlight it and make sure that all the employees have access to it and all the employees do know that that security policy exists. Organization of information security, asset management, how you manage the assets, human resources security, you know, your personal information in the human resources, how is it, well, how is it protected? Physical and environmental security, you know, your servers, your routers in the, in the network room has to be protected, not only from somebody having access to the you know, on someone having access to the actual physical room, but you know, what happens if the temperature goes very, very high in, in the summer days, you're gonna make sure that you have um, HVAC in that room, keep the room cool, the humidity has cannot be too high or even too low. So you have to have alarms in that network room. That's what we're talking about, environmental security. How do you set up the uh, communication and operation management, information system acquisitions, when you buy systems, what do you do? When you develop all of that access control, do you need a badge? Do you need maybe biometric 
um, access all depends. And all of that information is under network security domains that each one will, you should be familiar with. A lot of this is in the, that basic security course that we've discussed in later, uh, uh, prior to this. Okay, so again, the security policy, like I said, has to be a written document and everyone must know about it and on and goes over the components of the security policy. Okay, you could do it through a webinar if you need to, but it has to be there because if it's not written, no one will really, uh, it will be very, very difficult to enforce. Okay, this, uh, the Cisco Security X architecture, they have their own architecture. I think we can, this is the typical uh, network security architecture of how Cisco is set up. You have their VPN, their firewalls, their IPSs that they can set up. Um, so we'll be able to set, we can use our router to do a VPN and uh, the whole setup the firewall, the IPS, the AAA, like I said earlier tonight. Okay, so Cisco has product that can secure your emails, secure your mobile devices, have AAA for a secure access, all of that. All right, so um, I want you to write this down. The security X security technology can do, here's the architecture, those five things it can do for you. So write that down. And I think we can actually just, we don't need to get into that. This is the, the security intelligence operation. This is like a, a website that you can go to and get all out of the information that you need to for the malicious content, the endpoints, everything that you need to know about security and has to, to secure your network. All right, um, to mitigate defending the network, the best practices, so I want you to write this down. The best practices on how to defend your network. So that's another thing. Uh, you can, I think they're pretty um, straightforward. They don't need a lot of experience. And for example, shut down unnecessary services and ports. So you need to know when you purchase a software, what are the defaults? And if you are not using them, you know, for example, if, if there is a guest username, get rid of it. If there are certain commands or or um, or even apps that are automatically installed, if you're not going to use it, delete them because they may have security loopholes. All right, again, uh, please write those best practices for defending your network and uh, mitigating when it comes to malware. You got to do the containment, either do inoculations, quarantine the device maybe, and taking care of it, you know, treatment later on against uh, reconnaissance attacks. How do you prevent that? You can implement authentication to secure proper access, use encryptions. Um, when it comes to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to access attacks, make sure you have this strong password security. You know, you can make sure that users, you can actually set that up. You don't even have to ask the user. Tell them that your password has to be a minimum of 10 characters and it has to have, you know, capital letters, lowercase letters, and uh, maybe some symbols involved. And you can use a password cracker to test and, and you know a penetration tool to make sure that these are uh, you know that they adhered to the password um, to the strong password security. Uh, you can make sure that you have everything is encrypted. For example, also um, denial of service attacks. You want to use an IPS and a firewall together. We'll be able to set those up later on anti-spoofing technologies there are out there this is the actual firewall that we'll be able to use uh quality of service track traffic uh, service traffic po po policy which which means um allowing specific data to go forward before others okay i think we are almost there we're not going to we don't need to discuss any of that for now 
And uh, that's it. That takes us to approximately an hour of a lecture. I wanted to keep it to an hour. That's why I had to speed it up a little bit. So all the um, information that I told you to write down, please write those down in Microsoft Word. Save it and submit it as your homework. If you are not clear about anything, go back, rewind, and listen. If you still have any questions, please ask. And again, don't forget, you need to read your book to get more details. And if you can get to the Cisco site, that's probably the place you want to be. And just go through it. Take your time doing it before you take the tests for Chapter 1. Okay? Again, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Don't let anything go. Ask, jot down any questions that you have and bring it into class and we'll go over it together. All right. So until the next lesson, I'll see you later.